Has Samsung produced a noteworthy phone? And what can competitors do to keep up? Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. Welcome to Vertical Hold, Behind the Tech News, where we talk to Australia's leading technology journalists to get the stories behind the news of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, and I'm joined as always by Adam Turner, a man who probably wasn't up at the crack of dawn today to catch all the Samsung news. Adam, what's the world like when you've had enough sleep? Uh, Sadly, I wouldn't know. I was also awake at stupid o'clock, but I wasn't getting paid for it. So, you know, at least you were, you know, earning a few bucks for getting up at Samsung o'clock. Wait, 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 wait. We get paid for this? When? Oh, yeah. I wasn't supposed to tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) Now, we'll be crossing shortly over to New York when news tech editor Jennifer Dudley Nicholson has been at the Galaxy Unpacked launch. And more locally, we're also joined in the virtual Vertical Hold studio by Jason Murray from Osdroid. Jason, welcome back to the show. Hi, how's it going? It's going well, but tired. Yeah, I was also up the crack of dawn. So it's time once again to crank up the vertical hold satellite and cross over live to New York, where with a little bit of luck and as long as Adam's been feeding it enough 20 cent pieces, we should be able to get Jen Dudley Nicholson from News Limited. Jen, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Ah! The wonders of technology. The satellite is still up there and 20 cent pieces willing it'll stay up there long enough. Now, you've been at the Galaxy Unpacked launch today, looking at all the phones that uh, Samsung was hoping to surprise people with, but it didn't really turn out to be all that much of a surprise, did it? No, there are a lot of leaks this year. I mean, I I don't know if they all came from Samsung, but they certainly came from someone close to Samsung because we saw some of this stuff beforehand. Yeah, there, I mean, uh, the, certainly visually, we kind of knew what to expect, and uh, there was—I mean, there was there was technical detail, and there were a few features to surprise. Uh, I suppose one of the bigger things that was heavily rumored and sadly turned out to be true was the death of the headphone jack. Are you going to miss it? Are you going to pour one out for the headphone jack on Samsung phones, Jen? Yeah, I'm I'm not really on board with this. I actually really like the headphone jack and and more to the point, I really hate having to look around for either adapters in order to plug in a perfectly good pair of headphones into a phone that doesn't have one or having to uh, to look for that one earpiece that seems to have gone missing. So I'm actually really disappointed to see that it's disappeared. And I really would have thought that the last place it would have disappeared from is the Note, being that it's traditionally a larger phone, and I think that people who buy Notes are quite happy for it to be a larger phone typically. Um, so, yeah, I was I was a bit surprised. Even though there were rumours beforehand, I was a bit surprised to see that. Mm. Now, speaking of the Note being a larger phone, it's a larger phone or a smaller phone because they're now doing Notes in different sizes with this idea that people wanted a smaller Note. Do you think that's true? Look, me personally, no, I'm always for the larger phone, although it is getting up to, I mean, as some of the analysts I've been talking to um, say, tablet size. Now we're talking about 6.8 inch screens. Um, However, I mean, everyone else is saying that, yes, there are people out there who really like the idea of the note. They like the idea of writing on the screen, but they do not want a really big phone. They want kind of a standard size phone that does all of that stuff too. And apparently it's females. So it's not me. But uh, apparently it's it's females similar to me with maybe smaller hands or smaller pockets or something who are after this note. And I think it's a really interesting idea too because we're talking about, even though it's a smaller phone, it's got a 6.3-inch screen. So it's not a small phone in particular. It just feels a lot smaller than the regular size note, which has gone up in size. It's a weird kind of compromise of advice too, though, because it's lower resolution screen and there's no support for storage expansion. But, you know, and you get that on the Note 10 Plus and the Note 10 Plus 5G. Yeah, I think, I mean, what what really, it, what interests me too is that, I mean, if they're producing the smaller one, then maybe they can, this gives them kind of extra room to go bigger with the big one though. Like maybe if there's, there's something to kind of appease the masses with the smaller Note, um, then maybe, you know, if you introduce a 6.8-inch screen, hell, if you introduce a 7-inch screen in future, maybe it doesn't matter so much because there's still an option for people. 
Um, but this idea of like a cut down note is an interesting one. And I'm glad they didn't do anything crazy, like actually get rid of the the pen for it or something, because it, it, then it wouldn't have really been a note. They've also done interesting stuff with the storage, especially for the models we're going to see here in Australia, because where you used to kind of think, right, well, I'll get a note with this much storage or that much storage. It's pretty much, right, here's the Note 10, here's the Note 10 Plus, here's the Note 10 Plus 5G. They have they have fixed storage amounts. I think it's 256 gig for the Note 10 and Note 10 Plus and 512 for the 5G model. And that's it. There's not a lot of variance there. No, and I think maybe that's where the, it got a bit confusing around the S10 time because – you had the S10 and then you had the S10 Plus and then there was the S10 5G and then you had all the storage variants on it and then you you got to choose between ceramic or you got to choose between like the regular style and, and you could only get the ceramic in like the one terabyte version and that one wasn't available through carriers and I think it became very confusing. So I, I actually think that it was a Samsung Australia decision to just choose, okay, you know, this is what you get, you get what you get and don't get upset. You can, um, in, in most of the models, sort of add an SD card as well so that, you know, you can boost the storage if you really, you know, need more than 512, for example. Um, so, I mean, I'm not necessarily against the simplification, although I would like to see 5G in more models. Yeah, the 5G model is an interesting one as well because it's going to be Optus's first 5G phone here in Australia. I kind of expected that it would land with Telstra, but Optus was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I mean, I, I think that a lot of people who I've talked to, you know, when they're talking about, you know, their next phone are talking about either having an awareness of it having to be 5G or, uh, you know, sort of thinking about whether they need to future proof themselves in this way, because we've seen spots of it. And I don't think that Optus is talking about a huge area either that they've covered with 5G just yet, because it is really still in its infancy. And we hadn't even talked about it coming to 2020 until things sped up quite recently. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, making potentially a $2,000 purchase, it's something that you're really going to think about. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Now, you're obviously one of the very few people who's been able to go hands-on with the device. And uh, one of the big things for note phones, of course, is the S Pen. Are air gestures the new magic wand that Samsung wants them to be? <laughs> Actually, I think that this year they're quite useful. And it'll be interesting for me to see how people – um, actually communicate these to consumers because I think the S Pen can do a lot more than people actually use it for and I think some of the the gestures and stuff are kind of hard to decipher and hard it's hard to know what you can actually do with these things. Um, some of the nice things I've seen this year that in addition to it being sort of a remote control for a camera so you can take you know the, a, an epic selfie that you've set up looking off into the distance and being all moody when there's actually nobody else there um, you can sort of move the, the camera like through the different modes um, quite easily with gestures and you can flip from the front camera to the back camera. So if you have your, your phone on some sort of tripod, that's very easy to do. Um, some of the stuff around AR with writing on the screen is good. But the thing for me that was really cool is when you can when you, you can actually scribble notes and then you can have them uh, transferred into text that you can then send on. So potentially you could take notes in a meeting or take notes in a lecture and you can just highlight those with your finger afterwards and have the phone translate those into text. And when I've actually used that, and I've used it maybe five, six times, it actually understood my handwriting. And I'm a journalist. I did not have particularly neat handwriting um, and it, it managed to decipher that. So I think those sorts of things could be really useful as long as people realise they can use them. Yeah, I have terrible handwriting and I'm really keen to see what it makes of it. <laughs> um, I suppose this also switches to that productivity focus because Samsung's got a lot of phones in market, but the Note was always meant to be, this is your productive workhorse. And they, they talked around DeX and their Microsoft Word integration. And I know you travel a lot and you like travelling light. Do you think the Note 10 could become your working computer the way that Samsung seems to think it should be? You know, a lot of people have talked about Dex and previously you've had to have sort of a, a specific cradle to, you know, dock it and then connect it to a device. And there's been a lot of talk around, you know, you, connecting it to a monitor and working from it and stuff. I actually haven't done that before um, just because it required an extra purchase. So this idea that they're, they're really team closely with Microsoft this time and all you'll need is a cord so you can plug it 
a USB-C cord so you can plug it from your phone into your Windows computer, whatever that is, and be able to use it. I think that that would be amazing. And so I'm hoping that it is as simple as they make out and that there aren't any caveats on that. I think if Microsoft and Samsung are serious about teaming up, um, it could be really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested to use it. Um, but, no, I, I haven't used that so far. Okay. I know you're also someone who's super, super keen on cameras, and we've had some amazing camera phones this year. Samsung, of course, was not going to get up on stage and say, oh, yeah, look, it's got a few cameras in there. We just we, we left them in there. Is it as good as Samsung says, and how does it compare? Well, it's interesting because nothing, it hasn't changed an incredible amount, the cameras in this phone. So largely they've used the cameras from the S10, the S10 5G, um, which are fantastic. And I love the ability to sort of change between ultra wide, wide and telephoto. And I think that that makes a huge difference when you're out and you're taking photos. Um, what they have done is apparently the time of flight camera in the back of the um, the new phone, the Note, um, is a lot better, and that could be useful in terms of really locking focus on quickly um, and those sorts of things. So I'm keen to use that. I haven't really had a chance to properly test that. They're talking about the night mode being quite good, which is something that um, Google has really nailed, and Samsung has gone some way to getting better at, at low light capabilities, but we we haven't, you know, 100% um, seen that, that match just yet. Um, one thing that did interest me, though, is that, They've got a very small, like, um, sort of punch hole on the front um, where the camera actually sticks through on the front screen. But that means that there's only one camera at the front. And so if people are taking selfies, um, and apparently everybody is because this is a phone for millennials as they were trying to um, <laughs> talk about it today. It's all about um, the youth. Apparently the youth. Um, so there's not two, so you won't be able to get the portrait mode um, uh, selfies in the same way as you will on the current some of the current S10 series. So I thought that was a bit interesting that they decided to leave that one out. Uh, but I'm very keen to test um, the, the cameras on the back of this phone and also some of the weird stuff they did around video and being able to take portrait style video. Cool. They're also promising, um, well, not exactly better battery life. There's, there's a weird battery story here because it was all about this super fast charging thing until you read the fine print and realise the super fast charge is not actually sitting in the box that it comes with. No, you'll have to pay, I think it's another $69 for the super fast charger. Oh! Wow. Yeah. Wow. Which, my, um, my wallet is it'll be that, a super I, fast drain on your wallet. I will yeah. say in their, in their defence though, and not necessarily around the super fast charger, but I was quite surprised this year that the price hasn't gone up immensely because we've seen some some phones that have really broken through the $2,000 barrier and just kept on going straight to bankruptcy. Um, and this year, it, it wasn't an extreme sort of, you know, price climb, which is what I expected to see, to be honest, especially when you're talking about, you know, a, a productivity phone with a 6.8-inch screen. Yeah, the pricing's interesting, especially because Samsung's got so many phones in market now. Like yeah. if you add up every phone they've launched and every variant, you're, you're well over 10 phones that they're offering if you include the A series. And even without it, lots of S phones, lots of variants, all kind of the same size, all kind of the same design. I, I wonder how well the Note 10 can stand out in such a kind of flooded market. I think the Note does, I mean, aside from that whole fire business that we're not talking about um, anymore with the Note 7, I think the Note does have its own kind of personality because the Note was the first phone where we really saw the big size come out and it's got the pen which kind of makes it stand out. Um, I think that the fact that Samsung has so many phones in market at the moment is simply due to the fact that it's harder to get people to upgrade at the moment. Um, the market is really saturated. Most of us have smartphones already. You're not upgrading a whole lot of people from feature phones anymore unless they're actually living in a basement and, and putting soup packets all around their, their walls. Um, I, I think it, it's really it's a struggle for all of the manufacturers to get people to upgrade at the moment. And so they're trying to appeal to the most markets possible. I mean, even, even Apple has, you know, quite a few phones um, in the market at the moment where possibly about to see some more so i'm not necessarily surprised by that i think that the note does have an audience i'm going to be interested to see 
whether people actually go for the, the smaller version of it as well and whether it picks up a new audience from that. Now, I'm someone who is quite open about the fact that I loathe the Bixby button. I'm not a big fan of Bixby generally, but the saints be praised, this thing doesn't actually have a Bixby button, sort of, does it? Uh, no, no, not really. And so it, it's really interesting, though, because I went, I was playing with this phone and I tried to turn it off and I realized that there's no off button. And so then I tried the Bixby button. Throw and it at a wall, out. wait till it breaks. Or... <laughs> well, that would work too. Um, but <laughs> they don't tend to like that. Um, so I tried the Bixby button and it turns out that that's the new off button. But if you hold it down, then that becomes the Bixby button. So in order to turn this phone off, you actually have to hold down the kind of like taking a screenshot. So you have to hold down one of the volume keys and what used to be the Bixby button. It's a bit confusing and I'm sure it's one of those things that with muscle memory you'll get used to, but it's probably best that you're not triggering Bixby all the time because it's still not incredibly useful. One of the things we didn't, of course, see that they're still remaining very quiet on, especially locally, is the Galaxy Fold, which would be yet another phone in their arsenal. You've got to imagine, though, the, the Galaxy Fold, I mean, it is a special device, so special that we haven't actually seen it yet. <laughs> um, and I'm so surprised that they didn't mention it today because everybody was thinking about it. And I think DJ Co started to talk about, you know, the things that they announced in San Francisco in February, and we were all standing by waiting to hear. And by the way, I've got this one, and it really works this time, this time for sure, Bullwinkle. Um <laughs> But no, we didn't see, and maybe that's because it is such a, a memorable phone and something completely different um, that they didn't want to take away from what the Note was offering. DJ Co did have a watch that he'd like you to buy, though, Jen. Do you want to buy a watch? <laughs> I don't necessarily need a watch. Uh, no, they, they, I, I like the look of the new watch. I'm surprised that... I mean, this is their top of the line watch and they're still calling it the active name. Uh, and I suppose that's part of the redesign they've had. Um, and they're trying to bring back the bezel without actually showing a bezel. So you can sort of spin your finger around the outside um, to to make different um, yeah, uh, selections, but it doesn't actually spin part of the watch. So that was interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's this whole idea of it, it's the active watch too. I thought that was a, that was a bit interesting. It's very quick to market. I mean, I had a little bit of hands-on time with one in, in Sydney late last week, and I'm still not sold. I like the old physical rotating bezel. There was something to that. But uh, it's yeah. very quick to market after the Galaxy Watch Active, because that's only been here in Australia for a few months as well. Oh, I, do, I did like the software redesign on the Active, I've got to say. like It, it disappoints in a few ways in terms of like it doesn't have all of the software features um, that the top of the line model had, but I do like the software update and the UI update, which I think was long overdue because even though they've changed, Samsung has changed, um, you know, the, the style of the watch on the outside and added some features, they haven't actually changed what was really kind of an old state look for the phone, for the, the watch rather. And so I'm glad that they've updated that. And the watch actually looks quite attractive, which is nice and maybe something that Apple should be looking at too. Mm. They also had a few things with keyboards. They pre-announced the Tab S6, which I've had a little bit of hands-on time with, as well as a Galaxy Book S, which I'm very surprised to note we will see at some point in Australia. Yeah, so Samsung long ago said that, I'm sorry, the, the notebook market is just too crowded. We're not going to participate in it. Um, and now they've decided that this the notebook is the new tablet. Um, and maybe this is part of, you know, their, their new relationship, close relationship with Microsoft. But they've decided that, you know, this is, is yes, it's a notebook, but it's not all the way a notebook because you can put a, a SIM card in it and you can have always connectivity, always on connectivity or whatever they like to call it. Um, it's a very attractive looking device up close. I'll be interested to see how much it is because they haven't said that. Um, it comes out in September in the States. I'm not sure about Australia. It just says later this year. Um, but it's very thin and it's the screen looks quite good and I'm I'm keen to use one. It won't be cheap though. I think I think they said it was a thousand US when it comes out there. So that'll that'll chunk up the price in Australia. Like 
it won't be an incredibly powerful device. It's definitely one for kind of, you know, travelers and, and basic users. But again, super attractive. Oh, for sure, for sure. And actually, the power is kind of interesting because it's not your, your traditional kind of Intel or AMD laptop, is it? No, it's not. So um, you're talking about, they, yeah, they've they've sort of ARM processor and stuff, and uh, and they're talking about 23 hours of of video playback on one single charge. So I mean, that gives you an idea that they've um they're working to a specific audience. So almost enough battery power for your next international trip, then. Uh, we'll see what Virgin Australia has in store for me. I just can't tell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well. Thank you so much for your time, Jen. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. So, Jason, Samsung put it all on the line this morning, but of course, they're only one part of the big ecosystem that is smartphones, that is Android. Where does all this fit into the big picture? I think it's really interesting. The uh, the the Note 10, it's looking like a good phone, but it's also looking like it's kind of just a Note, you know? If you're not already... If you're not already a Samsung user, I don't know if the Note 10 is really going to pull you in. Yeah. Uh, and where does it fit into the big picture? Like, what would you say the nearest competition if you're interested in a phone like that, but you're not necessarily interested in Samsung? That's a good question, right? Because the Note has always stood for power and performance. And th- so Samsung's gone out with a, a seven nanometer uh, processor on this model. And I'm not sure that there's actually anything comparable on other phones at the moment. Like, it's really easy to just say, hey, get a big screen and you've got a Galaxy Note competitor, but the Note does more than just a big screen. The So like something something like the Huawei P30 Pro, that's pretty close to Galaxy Note size. That's what's sitting on my desk at the moment. I don't really see anything that really pulls me over to a Note 10 from a Huawei phone, but I'm also not the Note 10's target audience. I don't like, I don't like using a stylus on my screen. I, like, I just... I, all of the note stuff just sort of like just sails past me. I'm sure it's a great big phone. Uh, I'm sure it's a great phone. It's a big phone and its power is there. But feature wise, um, I kind of feel like the camera on the note doesn't necessarily move the needle in the way that it needs to. Yeah, the Huawei picture is an interesting one. And I guess we might see their productivity play in the Mate 30 when and if that appears. And I guess when and if that has Android, because that's their big strike. Oh, no. <laughs> God, can you imagine what would happen if you get a, a Mate 30 and it's running Hongming? Well, I can't imagine they'll sell too many of those in Australia. But this is, I guess, Samsung's bigger picture, though, because in that Android space, an incredible quantity of the traffic and the interest and the sales and so on are going Samsung's way. And probably the bravest thing they've done this time around is, is kill the headphone jack. Yeah, I was I was just walking past someone uh, in in the office at work, and uh, I heard a, just a casual conversation. Yep, they've lost me. They've killed the headphone jack. I'm going with someone else. But you know, where 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 do they jump to? I mean, we know of a few upcoming phones. We just mentioned the Mate 30, but obviously Huawei's Google positioning makes that one a little dodgy. Sony's kind of gone. We know a surprising amount about the Pixel 4, though, don't don't we? We do. We do know there'll be an XL if uh, if big screens are your thing. Um, Less so on stylus input, but you could probably expect that the uh, the Pixel 4 will probably be running the uh, maybe the Snapdragon 855 Plus or just an 855. It's kind of a weird kind of a weird point for Qualcomm processor releases because there's no there's no sort of obvious step up from the 855 coming out. Yeah, and I guess with the Pixel 4, you might not need a stylus because it's uh, what is it Project Solly? they they're whole completely hands free. You know, forget air gestures. You don't even need a stylus with this thing in theory. I'm I'm still trying to work out at what point I want to use my phone and not have it within reach, though. I am so I <laughs> I'm a poor person to talk about Project Solly because I'm really skeptical on it. Um, we saw we LG. Welcome skeptics on this show. Oh, that, oh that, that, that's one good. of us. Right time. One of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we saw LG do a time of flight sensor facing forward on the front of the mm. phone on the LG G8, uh, and it's weird. Like it's really weird. That's I don't, very charitable. I, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, I, if, if I want to volume, turn the volume up or down on my phone, I want to push a button. I don't. I don't want to like make a dial in between my fingers and turn it. Like it doesn't save me time. I'm just. I, I, I'm really not sure what the the front facing gestures from Project Solly are really going to bring to the Pixel. I'm 
more than willing to be. Well, maybe they'll work, unlike the LG. That'd be a nice start. (laughs) Yes. Look, I'm more than willing to be corrected on this, but, um, you know, I'll I'll see what Google comes up with. But, uh, yeah, like like I said, I'm a skeptic. And I suppose the, the other thing is, and I mentioned this in my chat with Jen, Samsung's really flooded that market with phones. I mean, there's so many A series and S series and now notes, and we will at some point in Australia have the fold as well. There's just going to be Samsung branding everywhere a consumer looks. What else should they be looking at? I mean, there are, are there other brands you reckon people should be considering? Uh, if you if you step away from the premium flagship phones, then yeah, sure. I mean, like there's uh, companies like Oppo, uh, even some some of the HMD Nokia phones. If you if you're stepping down market away from the the, the super expensive, but also not as expensive as we thought, uh, Note 10. Then you know there's plenty of options, and you really you might do well to just take a look at what you actually want your phone to do, rather than just going all in on the biggest phone possible. Yeah, it wasn't for everyone, but I was one of the few who really rather liked the Nokia Nine PureView, for example. Yeah, I haven't used it myself. I've heard the camera is really quite disappointing. You've got to work with it. It's not. It doesn't work quite the same way that a lot of other camera phones do. It is a little bit closer to kind of using a DSLR. It's a bit more careful consideration of shots. It's not great for like fast action shots. It's not spectacular for low light, but it's a really interesting camera to use. It made me think about what I was doing with photography. And as you say, they've also got a lot of those lower end ones, although again, they sort of flood the market with, you know, 0.1, 0.2 phones for just about everything they've released, which again, could make it tricky to find this year's model. That's very true. I think Nokia has, uh, sorry, I say Nokia, HMD Global has acknowledged that their Nokia branding strategy or na- their naming strategy in their phones needs a bit of work. Uh, as far as the Samsung range goes, I, I actually think Samsung's done a really good job of unifying their offerings outside of the Galaxy S range this year. Like it's basically Galaxy A and a number after it that tells you, you know, sort of how much you're going to expect to pay for the phone. In years gone by, you had weird things going on like Galaxy J, Galaxy Youth, Galaxy whatever, and you couldn't really tell which phone is actually meant to be the the premium or the high end or the low end out of that. And I think now the Galaxy uh, the Galaxy A series presents a really really good option for consumers who don't want to get up to Galaxy S or even Galaxy Note. So the thing we haven't talked about here is five G. We're still not five G is popping up here and there in ranges, but we're not still seeing people going all in on 5g if you're the kind of person who's thinking i want to hold out for 5g a should you be holding out for 5g at this point and b what you should be should be you be looking at if you are i think if you're the kind of person who is holding out for 5g you probably need to move so that you're next to a telstra store (laughs) well you say that but one of the big surprises to come out of this morning's launch was the fact that optus kind of sort of soft announced its 5g mobile network because they're getting the 5G version of the Note 10. So Optus has uh, Optus has said that they're the first carrier in the world to stream the English Premier League over a 5G network to customers. I'm like, cool. Are you just going for the buzzword on that? I think you are. Well, they won't be doing it presumably until the 20th of September because they're actually waiting a fair while to get that 5G Note 10 plus. Ah, yes. So uh, there's a bit of a delay built in there, but... They've got a lot of sites like, I mean, 5G is is happening. It's perhaps not happening in as widespread a way as people might expect. And so far, I've got to admit, my own 5G Telstra adventures have not led me to those, you know, blistering speeds we were led to expect. I, I think we should probably be a little bit more fair on 5G, right? So when we all got given 5G devices by Telstra, there was no 5G. We couldn't find it anywhere. I even saw your, uh, I even saw your attempts to to find them in the, in the park under Sydney Harbour Bridge. But... The the five G networks are better now. Telstra is actually installing. This Telstra's is true. Yeah, yeah. Telstra's installing five G um, radios on their four G towers, so they are spreading that network out to where it needs to be. It's not the five G that we're going to have long term, but it's at least something to get your phone onto. As far as speed goes, Telstra's only really said that you can expect speed about double four G. That's a far cry. From the you know two gigs a second that we would we would see uh, like Oppo and Samsung's test phones pull when you're standing directly under the 5G tower in the Telstra building, and so I look I, I think part of the problem with 5G in Australia is actually that we've got bloody good 4G networks. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I, I was actually going to say that double 4G thing, of course, is has to be qualified by the fact that even Telstra says, look, 4G can drop, you know, as low as one to two megs. So maybe that double 5G speed is only two to four meg. Yeah, no, exactly. It can exactly. still be quite slow. And, and sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But you're not wrong. We're, we're, we're quite spoilt in world terms. And any time you travel, you realise this because you jump on an international travelling sim, even if it's sitting on 4G, and you suddenly realise, wow, this is really slow and bad. Absolutely. And look, I, so I, I think when you talk to someone and you're like, why do we need 5G? You sort of got to consider that this person's handset on 4G may have been pulling 100 megs. So do they really need 200 megs? Yeah, maybe not. But as far as, as far as getting on 5G, you know, if you are someone who likes to live on the edge uh, and you're going to get a 5G phone, maybe, uh, I don't know, it depends whether or not whether or not the Note 10 is actually the one for you. I think it's about the same price as the S10 5G, isn't it? Well, the S10 5G doesn't kind of officially have a price because it's still that Telstra exclusive oh, thing, right. but it's basically, yes. it's basically two grand. You're not wrong. The difference there, though, and I touched on this with Jen a little bit as well, but the difference there, though, is the S10 5G is quite a different phone from the S10 Plus, whereas the Note 10 5G is just a Note 10, uh, Note 10 Plus 5G, sorry, is just a Note 10 Plus with more storage, admittedly, but you could boost that with SD cards pretty easily. And a 5G modem. There's no other difference on board. So you're paying quite a premium for that 5G modem, which is a trick actually Oppo did as well with the with the Reno 5G. Yeah, I, I mean, look, you're paying you're paying uh, what is it, three hundred dollars for an extra two fifty six gigs of storage and the ability to get data faster. I, like, I I don't personally think that it's necessary, but uh, you know, everyone's mileage may vary. There are some people who just feel like they really have to be on the bleeding edge and get the latest uh, the latest thing. But I just don't think 5G is there for them. Well, folks, that's just about it for another fine episode of Vertical Hold. So what do you think? Are you enticed by the Note 10? Does the loss of the headphone jack make you sad? Let us know via Twitter or the Vertical Hold Facebook page. Thanks to Jason for joining us in studio for the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Always a pleasure. And thanks long distance to Jen, if you can still hear us. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Like I keep saying, we're in a big push this year to reach new people. So grab your podcasting platform of choice. Leave us a review and help spread the good word. Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. I was going to throw in hello, is it G you're looking for? But yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, you can't take I'm the a, moral high ground when it comes I to don't puns. Know, I'm a terrible influence. I'm a terrible influence. <laughs> I have no moral high ground. <laughs>